Good afternoon. Welcome back to the arena. My name is Dennis Sailing. I am a parishioner at St. Francis Xavier in Burbank. I am also a part of the 2027 cohort of deacon aspirants here in the diocese. Let us um, prepare ourselves to, to enjoy the next hour or so with Father Leo by putting ourselves in prayer. O oh Lord, our God, creative force that continues to flow through all of life, awakening human hearts, enlightening minds, birthing ministries, strengthening the weary. Teach us to embrace your grace, to continue building your kingdom of love through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So I have a feeling I'm introducing someone who most of you already know, but for those of you who don't, we're hearing today from Father Leo Petalinghug. Father Leo is the founder, oh, wait, initial applause. <laughs> Father Leo is the founder and director of Plating Grace and the Table Foundation. He's a Catholic priest, television and multimedia host, best-selling author, internationally acclaimed conference and mission speaker, professional chef, and food truck owner. In Southern California, what matters? Good food truck. His mission includes serving ex-cons and disadvantaged communities. You can see him on EWTN and practically everywhere else. Father Leo. Thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. I just want to make sure, can people hear me okay? Okay, good. Does this microphone make me sound taller? Is that a yes? Okay, I will see you in confession for lying to me then. What a upgrade to be able to speak to the arena about this thing called embracing grace. And the only way we can do that is because, honestly, when sometimes people hear the word grace, they automatically think of amazing grace. They might think of a girl's name. We do know that grace is the root word of grazie, gracias, thank you, so manners. But honestly, when people think of grace, the modern world might actually think that we're talking religious stuff and if you talk about religion, it only belongs in a church. And if you talk about religion, people think that God, that religion, that grace is, it's the B word. What is it? Boring. Thank God you used that word and not another B word. This is a Catholic conference, right? People sometimes think that the Catholic Church, which is the, possesses the fullness of grace, they think that we are boring. Anyone here think that mass and church and faith is sometimes boring? Raise your hand. Raise your, okay, good. There's like 15 honest people in this whole congregation. So what I wanna do is I wanna give you a definition of boring so that no one will ever be bored at church again, and then you can embrace God's grace. Because if we think that grace is boring, I don't want anything to do with it. If I know it is amazing, then it requires us to do something. We have to start plating grace.com. Because when you are serving up God's goodness, people are gonna get excited. So what makes grace the exact opposite of boring, in fact, dynamic? A word in Greek, dunamai, which means power. It's the same root word as dynamite. How do we make grace dynamic? Well, the answer is to make sure people are asking questions. In other words, boring 
can be defined as answering a question that no one is asking. Do you hear it? If you start talking about stuff and no one is asking about it, then guess what? You are boring. So when people come to church, there was a mom, she actually came to church and she goes, Father Leo, my kid don't get nothing out of church and he don't eat broccoli. <laughs> oh, and by the way, that's not how she talked, but that's exactly how she sounded, all right? <laughs> and so I said to her, ma'am, this is very serious. So I asked her, how do you prepare your broccoli? <laughs> and, uh, and she explained it, and I said, ma'am, with all due respect, that, that sounds kind of disgusting. <laughs> you, know, you know what she did with her broccoli? She boiled her broccoli, made the whole house smell like, you know, the magical fruit. So I gave her a recipe. The kid now eats broccoli. The kid is interested in eating broccoli. But the bigger question is, why is this kid not getting anything out of the Catholic Church? And his answer is, it's boring. And the three sources of boring that I can determine, it might be the priest's fault. We might be boring. And, and, and you're thinking, where is Father? Is he listening to this talk right now? <laughs> Did he sign up for Father Leo's talk right now? And, and I'm being honest with you. Being a priest is far from boring, but sometimes if we're talking about things and people aren't really interested in it, it's because they're not questioning, maybe I need to learn how to communicate the language in a way that is going to feed the flock without boring them. Because the most boring part of the Mass, you know what it is. It's the? Oh, see? <laughs> but let me tell you that the word homily is not Greek for time to read the bulletin. <laughs> the word homily does not mean time to take a nap. The word homily in Greek, omelain, literally means familiar conversation. And it shows up one place in all of sacred scriptures, on the road to Emmaus. And it described what the two men were doing with each other as they were walking along a road. They were having a homily. They were having a familiar conversation. And what does Jesus do to prove he's not boring? He jumps in like a conversational ninja, and he says, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> and then they say, are you the only one here that's not talking about it? Do you know what the reality is? The reason why priests might be boring is because we don't have a way to connect to you as well as we would like. There's one guy for a parish of like 500 to sometimes 5,000 families. How is this gonna happen? Well, I say, cook for them. <laughs> and if you can't cook for them, I will. We have events around the country and even around the world where I will go and I will cook and I will give a talk on the theology of food, which we're gonna talk about, and people come and they'll say like, it's so nice to be able just to sit down and talk to my priest as a spiritual father, not only at the most important table, the Lord's, but at your own domestic church's altar, which is the dinner table. You know, whenever you invite a priest to dinner, and maybe if you think that priests are boring, invite him to dinner. I guarantee you, you will laugh your face off. You will find so much more, in basically get to know the person around food. You know, when I was younger, I don't know if you're gonna believe this, but when I was younger, I was a little, I was a little cantankerous. I was a little hyper. I know that's surprising to you now, right? 
And there were times when I would look at my mom and I would say, now I was 12 years old, I remember. I said to my mom, mom, this place is so boring. I am going to die. And my mom said, you picked the right place to do it. <laughs> I came up to my dad at mass. I'm like, this priest is the worst. He is so boring. So after mass, he goes, you think he's come with me? He brought me to the priest and he said, Leo, tell father what you just said to me. <laughs> he wanted me to tell the truth to a priest. <laughs> That's like, child abuse or something, right? I mean, how dare he make me tell the truth? So I said to him, Father, I said to my dad that I didn't fully understand your homily. <laughs> and my dad's like, that's not what you said. Tell him the truth. So I said, fine. I said that you were boring. And the man turned white, which is shocking because he was already super white. <laughs> And the first words out of his mouth were, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. You see, because for a priest, talking about all these technical things, it's exciting to us. Theology is a big deal. We love theology. But we don't know where you are. And if you are not having conversations, familiar conversations at home, about Jesus, about God, about the church, then you're gonna come into church and not have a developed sense, a taste for it. It's like giving a kid foie gras, <laughs> which is enlarged goose liver. And it is so delicious. <laughs> but if all you're used to is chicken nuggets, <laughs> which by the way, I have no trouble with chicken nuggets. I still eat it on occasion. I don't know what part of the chicken it comes from, but it's good. And by the way, don't judge me. My favorite fast food is Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, I know. And, and I think you will judge me, but I don't care. The colonel will one day be beatified a saint, okay? <laughs> and if I can't get that fried chicken, then I go to the, I go to get Jesus chicken. Chick-fil-A. Problem is, I usually crave them on Sundays. <laughs> and if I can't get my fried chicken fix then, I go to Popeyes. Because if you look at the word Popeyes, it literally spells Pope, yes. <laughs> so, if you don't have an opportunity to connect to your priest, and you're not talking about Jesus at home and don't have a developed taste for the higher truths, then you will be boring. You will be bored, that is. So we as priests need to know what you're talking about. You know what that priest did? He called my family up and he said, I'd like for Leo to come to my office and if your parents can come with you. And I thought I was getting kicked out of the Catholic Church. And I was so excited for that meeting. I was so excited. He made me read the scriptures with him for the following Sunday, basically asking my consultation. He wanted to know what I thought about those readings. Basically, he was using my consultation services and didn't even pay me for it. It was. And you know what's interesting? I showed up at church the next morning, excuse me, the next weekend. I was kind of ready to hear what he had to say. And can I tell you something? He was still kind of boring. <laughs> like his ability to speak, he was still not like there. But can I say also what he had to say was very interesting. What he had to say versus how he said it are two different things. And I got to ask you this. If I ask you to preach about next Sunday's readings at Mass, how will you do? <laughs> Go ahead and try it on your kids. 
See, so the priest can be the problem. The second problem is that the devil is real, constantly distracting the mind at mass, constantly feeding lies, and people are eating it up. The devil is real. He or she, I like to use inclusive language when I talk about the devil. <laughs> the devil is a master at plating sin, making bad things look good, and making good things look stupid. You know what we need to start doing? We need to start plating grace.com <laughs> better. We need, every one of us needs to ask ourselves, when we talk about faith, when we're presenting faith to people, when we're giving them the option, the choice between the secular and the sacred, how do we make the sacred look? I think we are evolving as, no, I know we are evolving as a church. We've had our traditions up and down. We are so focused on, is this liturgically left or liturgically right? Can I tell you, that is a distraction. We need to do what we do in the Catholic Church and do it well. If you're in charge of music, please know how to sing. <laughs> if you're in charge of lecturing, Please know there is a difference between the flames, the flaming blazers, or a flaming brazier. <laughs> if you are an usher, please smile. <laughs> there was a church in Baltimore where it had its feast days rooted in the exaltation of the cross. But the church was called the Church of the Crucifixion. And a priest who was recently assigned called in to just make sure that, that he had the right directions. And so he called the number, and the person answered the phone and said, Crucifixion! <laughs> you you got to know that every one of you that participates in the liturgy are part of the Catholic brand. And you know what our brand is? Holiness, wholesomeness, healthiness. And these are things that we need to do a better job of because if we don't do a good job at it, the devil will. And it's so shocking that just around the corner, maybe an hour away, excuse me, a Hollywood traffic, three hours away, <laughs> there is a city that is actually named Hollywood. It's just mispronounced. In the same way when people say, happy holidays, don't get upset about that. They're saying, happy holy days. They're just using bad accent. <laughs> so what we need to do is make Hollywood holy again. If you have a desire for the arts, get yourself there. Only after you find a spiritual director who will help you to stay holy in an environment that wants to make bad things look good. The third reason why that kid didn't get anything out of the Catholic Mass. Number one, us priests in our relationship. Two, the evil one and the relationship that we have with sin. Third reason, maybe that kid didn't come to church hungry because he was full of himself. <laughs> Which is why every Mass begins with an emptying of all that is not of God. Confession of grave sin. If we are so full of shiitake, <laughs> then there is no room to embrace grace. Because we can be so full of ourselves.
And I think arrogance is the real problem. We all have it. That's why I want to tell you about how humble I am. <laughs> Doesn't that sound awkward? See, true humility is when we were kids and our moms and dads and anyone who needed to feed us had to try to get you to eat something that you were not used to. You see, that kid ate my broccoli because I didn't boil it. I turned the oven on at 400 degrees. I blanched my broccoli quickly until it turned bright green. I pulled it out, dried it, hit it with olive oil, salt, pepper, garlic powder, Parmesan cheese, and Italian seasoned breadcrumbs, put it into the oven for 10 minutes, came out, he called me, he said, your broccoli tastes like green chicken nuggets. <laughs> because I know that that kid has teeth. He doesn't need to eat baby food anymore. That kid was not hungry for mushy. That kid was hungry for something substantial, something that he can chew on. We need to give everyone the proper profile that they can chew and digest, which means we can't talk about high morality to children in the same way we can't talk to adults like children. Let's start giving you the truth so that you can chew on it and be fed. But you know what this takes? This takes something that I've been working on for years. bite size theology found in this book. <laughs> because when we take theology and make it bite sizable then we can digest it and get used to it. In the same way, you know, we say church, and they're like, I don't want it. I don't want it. But if you say, just take a little bite, a little bite, a bite size, because let me tell you this, it only took a bite of the forbidden fruit to lead our world into a salvation decline. What will correct the one bite of the forbidden fruit? One bite of the blessed fruit that Jesus became. Because he knew that this world was just hungry, hungry for the greatest Food Network star it will ever know. <laughs> and, and, and who is that? Who is that? Did, did someone say Father Leo? Now, people know, I've been only on the Food Network a few times, like when I beat Bobby Flay on the Food Network episode. No, no, stop, stop. Season seven, episode one. And, uh, and I, I cheated. I, uh, I put holy water in the marinade. Okay, that's kind of what I did. So it's not me. Who is the greatest Food Network star? Okay, good. Thank you. Jesus. Jesus. Who made himself not only bite-sizable, but microscopic. Even to the point where he was recognized only by a cluster of cells as a cluster of cells. So small. And that cluster of cells, some people say, but it's just a cluster of cells. I know. But it's still life. I mean, if I found a cluster of cells on the planet Mars, I bet you we would spend a lot of money to protect that little cluster of cells. So a cluster of cells is still worthy. And they would say, oh, but it's just a fetus. And I, I get it. But please know that that word is just simply Latin for small person. You're welcome. <laughs> and there is nothing wrong with small persons. <laughs> so he became small from a woman who came from a know-nothing town, Nazareth, and born in a little town, little, little town of 
Dude, that was really bad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let's practice that. He was born in a little town of which in Aramaic means house of bread. And in Arabic, it means house of meat. Bread, meat, placed away in a... Which is the same word in Italian as mangiare. And you're like, oh my gosh, that sounds a lot like the Eucharist. Duh. <laughs> of course it does. Because Jesus is a serious foodie. <laughs> he made himself so small, bite sizable. You know what? I'll tell you later. See what I did there? I just made you think, what are you going to tell me? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you that story, but really what I do is tell you about how you can bring the Eucharist to a world that is disinterested to your family who thinks that you're crazy for coming to a religious conference. They think it's an excuse to go to Disneyland. <laughs> but you are here to an experience the communion of our church. And thank God you're here. Because in the midst of all the division, you are showing that even if we disagree, that doesn't mean hate speech and we can still come together around this table and receive something bite-sizable, which is the key to giving people who are not interested the ability to see and taste the goodness of the Lord. So I want to help you, and I want you to help me practice what I preach, by giving to you four words to help you bring the Eucharist to a disinterested world. And that word is bite-sized. And we're going to focus on bite, B-I-T-E, because that's exactly what you say to your kids. Just take a bite. Just take a small bite. A small... <laughs> or if they don't eat it, what do you do? You lie to them <laughs> and shove that spinach in a meatball <laughs> and wrap it in bacon. <laughs> I love my Jewish brothers and sisters, but at this moment, I'm glad I'm not <laughs> because I like bacon. And I know when the disciples, because Jesus even said this, when you go out into the world, I want you to spread the good news. How are you going to do it? He said, pack light. Get rid of your baggage. Be peaceful. Knock on the door and say, peace be with you. And then he said, eat what is set before you. And I know that these good Jewish boys had never tasted a Maryland crab cake. <laughs> they had never tasted Texas pulled pork barbecue. And I know when they tasted a little bite of bacon, a little bite of bacon, and I'm saying this right now knowing it is a Friday of Lent. <laughs> I'm testing your willpower to say no when it is appropriate, just like St. Teresa of Avila who said, when it's time to fast, it's time to fast. When it's time to feast, it's time to feast. And when those good Jewish boys tasted bacon for the first time, a little bite, I know the first words out of their mouth were, Alleluia. <laughs> Alleluia. So let's look at the word bite as a tool to help you give the beauty of the Eucharist to a disinterested world. Just take a small bite. B is going to stand for the Bible. Right now, I still think it's happening. In Ashbury, uh, Mississippi or Tennessee, it's a southern state. It's a Bible Belt state. In a university, they're having what is known as a revival that has been going on for several days. They're literally on a college campus praising Jesus. And why? Because those songs are rooted in the scriptures 
but in a way that touches the soul. And I know that there are some non-Catholic Christians who will say to me, but Father Leo, y'all Catholics don't read the Bible. And I say, read it? We wrote it. <laughs> it's our book. And, and I can tell you that's the truth because St. Jerome, who translated the scriptures, and by the way, I went to the cave where he translated those scriptures in a pilgrimage just in January with Steve Angrizano, and we went to that cave and prayed. And thankfully, I'm going back there next January with Steve Angrizano, available at platinggrace.com slash travel. So we <laughs> went to that cave where he translated the scriptures, and he said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, and you've heard that before. And you know what your kids and what this world is interested in? The Bible. It is so interesting to me that people who are against the church's teachings will say things like, but doesn't the Bible say that you have to love everybody? So they'll even quote the Bible. So the Bible is what this world is interested in. Learn it. We wrote it. And it's your job to not memorize lines because chat GPT can memorize things. <laughs> An animal can memorize things. But you're made in God's image and likeness. You're not called to memorize and regurgitate Bible passages to shove down their throat. <laughs> Your job is to interpret the scriptures in your life so that when people see you, they know that you are rooted in the scriptures, that you are rooted in the Bible. Where do you get that? At mass. The last time I checked, we don't just talk about one passage. We read four readings. It's a lot of Bible. And on top of that, all of the prayers, the Eucharistic prayers, they're the Bible. I, I, I think as Catholics, it's great that we have strong devotions, but we need to be re-rooted in the scriptures and make it in a way so that people can hear you talk about the Bible, not as a catechism lesson only, but as something that matters to you. Read the Bible every day. If you don't, get a chance to do that. You can listen to the Bible every day. That number one podcast with Father Michael Schmitz. Yeah, I know that that was a girl who just did that woo. I know it. <laughs> Father Schmitz and I are good friends. I can't stand standing next to him. <laughs> but I sure love the fact that he's trying to give us the Bible every day. And what does he do in that app? He interprets it in his own life. He makes it a part of his own life. Do you see where I'm going with this? Give people the Bible, but make sure you understand it. And if you don't, the real beauty is you can learn about it. There are so many resources like mine <laughs> at Booth 92. So there's just ways that you can make the scriptures bite-sizable. The other word, B-I, we might think, oh, we need to make the church interesting. No, the church is already interesting, incredibly interesting, to the point where when I was a kid, I didn't like church. And it wasn't until this priest came, he was a different priest, he was a missionary preacher, which is why I'm a missionary preacher. He was the start of my vocation. He showed up and he said, if you're coming to church and you don't know why, come to one night of the mission. And if you don't want to go to church after that, you don't have to go. So I looked at my mother and I said, I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. Because I didn't want to go. You know what he did? He didn't make it interesting. He just was so inspired, the word in spiritus, you know what he did? He explained the mass. He just explained the mass, from the vestments 
to why we do certain liturgical gestures. He just explained it. That's all. That's all he did. Just explained it. It's inspiring when we can understand our faith better. I mean, that's one reason why I actually have created a four-part series called the Teaching Mass that a lot of churches use now because it just breaks up the Mass into four parts, 20-minute videos, and it gets people thinking, what's the spirit of these liturgical actions? Why do we do what we do? Is it motivated by evil or is it motivated by good? Basically, what I'm asking you to do with this idea to be inspired is to make sure that when you talk to the world, what's your inspiration? Is it to convert them? Because we are not a church that proselytizes. We are a church that evangelizes, which simply means share the good news. That's what is the inspiration for all of your activity. So just check yourself. Check your heart. When you're talking to people about the faith, ask yourself, what's my inspiration for wanting to talk to them? Because if it's not motivated in love, then it's motivated in you just trying to prove the Catholic Church is the right church. And that's pride. Be its servant. And I guarantee you, if you're serving well, and it looks good, and you are plating grace. I'll pay you later. <laughs> then they're going to want to at least take a little bite because your inspiration was not malicious. Your inspiration was for their good. So parents, quick little tip. When your kids start saying, gosh, you know, mom, I really don't want to go to church, stop telling them that they should go to church. In fact, just simply don't be boring. Ask them a question. Say, well, tell me why you don't want to go to church. I'm like, I just don't know. I'm like, no, tell me about it. Keep just asking the question. Eventually, you know what the answer is going to be? I don't understand it. And then your inspiration can be, then let's study this together on a pilgrimage with Father Leo. Because this is where the T comes into play. T, B, Bible, I, inspiration. T, theology. People crave theology. Whether they know it or not, they crave theologos. The logos, logic, word of theo. They want to know what the logic of God is. Because if you don't have a good understanding of Theo logos, then the logos bio, biology, will be confused. The psyche logos, the logic of our psyche, which does not mean mind. Psyche in Greek means soul. Our soul will be confused. And if we are confused, then the logos socio, sociology, society will be confused. People need theology. But the word theology is hard. It is a different language altogether. And so I'm going to tell you how I understand theology because it's helped me. Theology can be understood with a, uh, a German word called gestalt. I, mean, I, I say that with an accent because you can see I'm German. <laughs> and the word gestalt is, is, is a methodology. And the word gestalt basically says, OK, now, you want to write this down. The whole is greater than the total sum of parts. Whole greater than total sum of parts. So what is the total sum of parts? I would liken it to like, I don't know, a box of puzzle pieces. All the parts are there. But it's not as good as when you take the time and you put the pieces together. Like when I was a kid, again, I know you're going to be surprised, but I was not the most patient kid. Surprising. I know it, right? My mom would give me a box of puzzle pieces, 5,000 pieces. I would be done in 20 minutes. I was brilliant. <laughs> or not, because my mom would be like, you can't be, let me, what did you do? She would see it, and she would realize that if pieces of the puzzle didn't fit, 
I found scissors and made them fit. <laughs> and what do you get at the end of that, me that process? A mess. Can you see why the world is a mess? Because we haven't taken the parts of our life, of the world, and put them together in a way that the author intended as a whole. Everything that we are going through right now in the world, from immorality to confusion to every type of ism, it's actually part of the bigger picture of this world. Those people actually have a part in God's creation. We just have to know how it fits. It doesn't mean that they should be dictating our laws. It means that our laws should be teaching them compassion. You see, what happens, though, is we get the cart before the horse and the tail starts to wag the dog because they don't have, they're not basing laws on theology. They're basing it on a confused psychology, a broken biology, and an immoral sociology. People need theology. And it's what keeps our Catholic Church together. The last word is B, Bible. I, inspired. T, theology. Whole is greater than the total sum of parts. And I'm just going to give you just a very beautiful thought that if, if the world is messy, and it is, okay, it's downright a disaster. Be patient. Take the pieces that confuse you and ask yourself, how is it going to fit into my prayer life? How is it going to fit into the way I treat people? Let's make sure that we don't discard any pieces, but let's make sure that that piece isn't simply quickly cut to try to shove it into its proper place. E, and this is a very unique one. It is called entertaining. And I know a lot of people would say, I can't believe that priest said that the church should be entertaining. And I'm not asking for lights, camera, action, smoke, unless it's incense <laughs> or barbecue outside. I'm asking that we engage the senses. That's what entertaining is, isn't it? It engages your senses. That's why churches in Europe are so entertaining to go into because they're beautiful. I mean, you look up and there's like pictures of these amazing saints and beautiful artwork. Sometimes you go into a church and you look up and you see plywood and rust stains and water drip, cobwebs. You can see, no, the only way that that's going to entertain us is if we're making fun of it. To engage people and their senses. And the way you do that is through food. And I know you're thinking, this priest has got to shut up about food <laughs> because I'm fasting today. <laughs> and if you're hungry at the end of this talk, good. I've done my job because you will only eat if you are hungry, which is kind of why I do what I do. Some of you are familiar with the work that I do, which is called Plating Grace, and it's an organization that tries to bring families back around the dinner table because that's where you can entertain the questions that your children are asking. This table is represented at your own home, the domestic church's altar. It's called your dinner table, dinner table, where literally the greatest lessons in life are learned. We believe that if you are platinggrace.com, then that dinner table becomes a desk. It becomes a desk where you teach and you entertain the questions that your kids are asking and where you can be humble enough to say, I don't know the answer to those questions. Let's do it together. And so 
The work that I do is all about food. I host a TV show, Savoring Our Faith, on EWTN. I travel around the country, around the world, giving talks and lectures about a theology of food. And I know you're thinking, theology of food? I mean, seriously, Father Leo, are you just stealing the idea of the theology of the body? No, because my idea came first. <laughs> Think about this. Before God made the body, God made food. And in the body, God created hunger, desire, appetite. And that is what your kids are hungering for. Our whole mission at Plate and Grace is to try to see how Jesus uses food to entertain and engage the crowd and, more importantly, to enter in, to touch people's hearts and lives. And so what I want to do is I just want to share with you a few of the resources that I have, and it's not a commercial. It's actually part of my talk. Because how do you start giving the Eucharist and the beautiful meaning to it at the dinner table? Well, you use this book. Because <laughs> this is just all about the liturgical calendar. You know what's really shocking? People actually think that the church is boring, and I say, B boring? If it weren't for our feast days, our economy would tank. Think about it. Christmas, that's our celebration of Jesus' birth. Oh, people say, oh, that's Santa Claus. No, that was December 6th. And that's the way he wanted to honor Jesus. You know, we have champagne on New Year's Day, New Year's Eve. Why? Because of our Catholic monk, Dom Perignon. <laughs> Wine, roses, chocolates. That's our Saint Valentinius who was a martyr, who showed that love requires sacrifice. Corned beef cabbage. Mm. Green beer. Who eats and drinks that stuff? I do. Because on that day, I'm Irish. And I even tell the world that my name today is Father Lee O. Pataling hug. That's who I am on that day. Because when you eat together, you are a family. And that's why people will ask, but how do you eat together as a family when my kids are running here, there, and everywhere? Well, that, I wrote this book. It's called Saving the Family, and we sold out, but you can always go online to get it. It teaches the family how to eat together in the different generations of your family life from like when you're feeding them mashed peas to when they're feeding you mashed peas <laughs> and everything in between. But you know where it really begins? This is where people are most interested. It begins in marriage. So I actually wrote a book about marriage and I know you're thinking, dude, you're a priest. <laughs> what do you know about marriage? And I know Enough I didn't want to get married, okay? <laughs> but God and I are on a mission to get rid of anniversaries because I think they're stupid. And now here, all the women don't like me, but all the husbands are like, shh, honey, just listen. Just what he really has to say. <laughs> when I say stupid, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just speaking a little Latin. Stupid, stupor, sleepy, slow. Why do you people wait once a year to celebrate your anniversary? With 12 chapters, <laughs> you can celebrate month anniversaries. And now the women are like, let's get that book. <laughs> and all the husbands are like, shut up. Father. So you see, like, we just like to have fun. I, I mean, in my newest book, which is, I know you're thinking, how much time does this guy write? I'm on a lot of planes. <laughs> so I gotta do something. And I teamed up with a great author named Michael Foley who wrote Drinking with the Saints. Very popular book. They asked me to write Dining with the Saints. And so this, is, this just came out next week. 
So this is all pre-release. And what's really funny is that I'm Filipino. I'm usually late for these things. <laughs> and, and, and I showed you this book already. And I'll just tell you that this nun read this book. And it's a book about the Eucharist, mass. It will entertain you. In fact, she wrote and said, your book made me laugh. It made me cry. It made me pray. But more importantly, it made me hungry for God. You see, I think that's one of the biggest struggles in our Catholic Church, is that we don't come hungry. We actually come to church thinking, what am I going to get out of this? When in fact, you're supposed to go to serve something from that. Which is why I have aprons. <laughs> because they are black. And therefore slimming. <laughs> but as soon as I put this on, you're, you're all asking, what are you going to cook? But the real question is, what am I going to serve? If you don't have an apron, I have one for you. <laughs> and it doesn't even have to be mine. But the apron that I want you to put on is what the Catholic Church ordained me in. When I was a deacon, I put this on for the first time. It's called a dalmatic, a servant's robe. Because again, if you are not wearing this, then you might think you are at church to be served. Last time I checked, you're there to become a servant. And that's the humility that it takes. See, our big struggle is we come to church not asking questions. And if you're not asking questions, it's because you either have all the answers or you don't think that the church can teach you anything. Do you see where the problem is? The problem we face with a disinterested world is that they think they know everything. And what we've got to do is humbly give to them a bite of God's goodness. You see, we're going to walk out of here being like, I am on fire. And that's what I normally do is I cook and I light stuff on fire. And people always ask, why did you light that on fire? And the answer is, because that's cool. <laughs> and I wanted to entertain you. I, I want you to know that the church is so filled with dynamism. We just have to learn how to make it bite sizable. So I'm asking my friend and travel partner, what I want to do is I want to bring this particular session to a prayerful close, and I'm going to end with a story. And when you hear these words, he's not here to entertain you. He's here to take the Bible, the inspiration, our theology, and your senses and enter into you so that we can make sure that the number one way <laughs> that we can serve the disinterested world with the gift of the Eucharist is prayer. It's so funny that people ask me all the time, can you pray for me? And I always say, how much you got? I'm like, you would charge me? I'm like, no, I would never charge you. But I want to know how much is it worth to you that I'm going to pray for you? What is it worth to you? Then if that's the case, then do it yourself. I will pray for you and it'll be an honor. But if it's worth it to you, you will pray too. Pray to be hungry. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord. 
thirsting for you, my God. Try it. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord. Thirsting for you, my God. And again, my soul is thirsting for you, O Lord. Thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you, my God. Oh God, you are my God. And I will always praise you. In the shadow of your wings I cling to you and you hold me high. Sing now. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you. My God, thirsting for you, my God. So, just before we sing that one more time, think about this. I, I, I wrote the song because my, I wrote the music two years before I wrote the words, and I sang it to my wife one day, and she said, just shut up. <laughs> it's like you've been playing that for two years. Either finish it or release her back to the universe. You know, but stop. Stop playing that. You're driving me crazy. And she said, just take a Bible and sing some words. I'm like, you can't just sing words out of the Bible, honey. You know, if you could do that, everybody write a song every day. And she threw, I'd like to think in a moment of inspiration, she threw her Bible in the general vicinity of my head. And, uh, and she said, just try. So I opened up the Bible and put my finger down on a random sentence, but it was a song. And the, the line my finger landed on. I said, you can't just sing the line that's there. Watch. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Okay, beginner's luck. That's all we're looking at right there. Yeah. But the, the beauty of that one sentence is, what does it say? What have we heard today? You know, that our hearts are hungry, that um, we desire community and fellowship, hope and faith and light and life of Christ in us. And so do me a favor, close your eyes right where you are. And if you're willing, just open your hands on your lap. And not because some guy with the guitar said so, but um, because we mean, Lord, I know when I'm physically thirsty what to do. I go get a drink of water. A lot of times we're spiritually thirsting and we don't even know. We don't even know. And Lord, we're not just going to talk about you today for just a minute. We seek you. Praise you, Jesus. My soul is thirsting for you, oh Lord. Thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord, thirsting for you, my God, thirsting for you, my God. Just listen once. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. I'll help you all my life. All my life you have been faithful. That's it. So, so good. All my life you have been so, so good with every breath with every breath that I am able I will sing I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been faithful. So, so good. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath, with every breath that I am made, I will sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Prayer doesn't change the world. It changes you. It makes you more of a servant. 
And a good servant, you know, doesn't shove anything down anyone's throat. They ask, what are you hungry for? And they work with the entire staff, the kitchen, and they give you something. And even if you're a little nervous, they'll give you a bite-sized sample. And that gets you hungry. See, when I was a kid, again, surprising, I was obnoxious. I don't know why you people laugh at that. Didn't like church, would sit there for an hour. And I wasn't bad because I was smart enough. It was just an hour. And if I did it well, we'd go to the farmer's market afterwards and I would get cotton candy. But then my mom would take us to the chapel where they had this little candle and she would make us pray, the entire family, little Filipino family, arms outstretched. I'm like, what are we doing? Didn't we just spend an hour in this place? What the, what, what are, my mom would say, you be quiet. We're praying to Jesus in the box. Praying to Jesus in the box? Obviously talking about the tabernacle. And I'm like, wait, I'm 12. You mean that Jesus is in the box? Yes, Jesus is in the box. And I'm like, what, is he a little person? Wait, what is going on? What do you mean by that? I'll be ordained a priest 25 years next year. Ah, thanks. Stop, stop, stop. I'm still learning how to make faith bite sizable, which is why if you want to help me and learn this as well, all you've got to do is text the word food to 33777. 33, the age that Jesus died and rose. By the way, they say that the body you have in heaven will be what you had when you were 33 which is why I did push-ups and sit-ups every day when I was 32. <laughs> and 777, why? Because it's better than 666. <laughs> so just text food to 33777. It'll bring you in to a world of bite-sizing theology. Because I realized after a priest so many years, why did Jesus become so small? only discernible at one point in his life with a microscope in a know-nothing town. Why did he start with only 12 disciples? Okay, 11. Replace the last one. Small number. Why did he become so small that you can, he can literally fit, as the ancient writers would say, making a throne for the king of kings? Why did he become so small? And now I know why so we can fit in our very busy schedules. So he can fit in our minds, which are just closing by the minute. So that he can fit in our hearts, which sometimes feels like it's shrinking. So that it can fit in our relationships with one another. And yes, the world might be disinterested but all you're asking is just for a little bite. So I want to say thank you to Steve, and we're just going to close with just one more line of, of just the words about thirsting. And so I'm just simply going to close by saying, I hope you're hungry to do the work of sharing the good news to a world that is disinterested. It's not easy to do. It sometimes takes a little priest to tell corny jokes or to cook a really good meal. And I believe that if you serve good food, your family will listen to you because they can't talk with their mouth full. <laughs> so the only thing that I can say at the end of this talk, and it was a real honor for me to do it, is bon appetit. The 
Let's pray one last time. My soul is thirsting for you, oh Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, oh Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you. I'll be honest, you didn't sound terribly convicted. So we'll do it one more time. One more time. If you're willing, close your eyes one last time and call to mind the one thing you really need to offer to God. You really need to surrender and say, Lord, I hunger for you and this stands in the way. This stands in the way. And I offer it to you, particularly it's Lent. I offer it to you. Whatever it is, we can't do it. God can do it. And with desire we sing. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord. Thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord. Thirsting for you. Thirsting for you, my God. Thank you, Stephen Agrisano. Thank you, Father Leo. Folks, please do take the time to fill out that evaluation. Let everyone know that you want to hear from Father Leo and certainly from Steve again. And uh, I think Father Leo would appreciate it if I reminded you that he's at Booth 92. <laughs>